Hi. Hi. That's me. I'm Mary. Uh, so I'm a senior interaction designer at Red Hat, um, and all of all these folks introduced themselves in just a second. Uh, but basically, we wanted to be a part of today uh, for a kind of different reason. So a lot of the talks you've probably been to and a lot of the stuff you've seen has been heavily on the technical side, learning about new concepts, seeing how people are using open source technology. Um, if we're taking a little bit of a different approach, uh, a little bit more philosophical, if you may, a little philanthropic. Um, so we're talking about how we're open sourcing out passion and opportunities uh, by building relationships and fostering relationships between uh, the tech industry and our local public schools. So everyone you see here today is either an active contributor uh, to partnerships with education or is in the ed, the ed space themselves. So it's a tech person helping with education or education. Um, so I'll kind of introduce myself a little bit more first. I said that I was uh, an interaction designer at Red Hat, uh, but I've also been for the last like five to seven years. I frankly don't know if I should include my time as an internship or not. So somewhere in that range, uh, I've been working really closely with specifically the Boston Public Schools, but a few others as well um, in a variety of ways ranging from working with the schools to bring them into the Red Hat Boston office uh, for field trips that they can learn about opportunities that exist that they might not know about, uh, gain mentorship experience, um, and also just really kind of show them that being in tech doesn't have to look like one thing, like right? A lot of times if we ask a kid, what do you think when you think of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math? They just think, yeah, you, you code, right? Just like a lot of us do, sure. But there are roles out there that don't involve coding, but still you know, are needed in order to make the tech industry powerful and successful. So um, that really made me interested during the start of the pandemic when schools were struggling so hard to make this transition to virtual learning. I felt as an experienced designer, like maybe I could do something here. Like the experience of education for a student, a teacher, parents was frankly pretty sucky. Um, wasn't great. So I decided to enroll in a master's of education and just wrapped that up in May. Um, so a lot of people on this panel here have uh, supported me through my journey and gotten involved as well. So uh, I am going to pass this mic down and hopefully not like do that weird echo thing. So I'm gonna have you turn it on once I hand it to you uh, and just introduce themselves. So your name, where you work, what Hi. you're oh. all about. Oh, can you guys hear me in the back? All right, awesome, microphone works. Hi, I'm Julia. Um, I work for Red Hat. Um, I did some internships. I actually was in the same intern class as Mary back in 2017. Um, and at Red Hat, I work on uh, the RHEL core kernel team uh, doing fixing security vulnerabilities um, in the kernel. Um, I also work on the Instruct Lab team, um, which is the Red Hat's new, kind of new, um, open source AI project. Um, if you've never heard of it, look it up, it's pretty cool. Um, and then in you know the little free time I have, I help out with um, any of the super cool uh, K-12 experiences that Mary puts on at the office. Um, my work is not the most exciting, so having opportunities to work with kids in the office really helps me, you know, enjoy the tech side of things. So I really like having the, you know, the different types of stuff that I work on. So thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Matt Crossman. Uh, I work at Fidelity. Um, I've, my job title officially is systems engineer. Uh, I've heard it be called DevOps, platform engineering, SRE, whatever you want to call it. It is your flavor. Works, whatever. <laughs> Uh, general idea is that I like to help developers kind of get their code out into production. Uh, so for less technical people, that means, you know, a developer might make a cool new website and give you a new page that can give you all kinds of information or whatever, and they've been developing that on their laptop, and eventually it needs to go out into the real world. And so I'm the person that helps them do that and then once it's out there make sure that it continues to run well and people can kind of you know check up on it and all that kind of stuff so 
Uh, that's like my day job. And obviously, uh, as Mary has kind of pointed out, uh, there's a lot of need for that kind of expertise in this space. Uh, so uh, I was actually helping Mary and uh, Russ over here uh, with some uh, issues that they were having with their school website and all that sort of stuff. And hopefully, I don't want to get into too much details, but uh, I definitely think that, you know, even as somebody who is more on the tech side, that uh, getting connected back to the people that actually need that help and need that expertise is a huge part of uh, what we can do to kind of make advancements and, you know, fix things. Hi, I'm Pauline Kimsong. I am a computer science teacher at Marshall Simons Middle School in Burlington. I met Mary um, during my um, licensure program, right, at, at Leslie. So I was going for an instructional technology specialist licensure, um, and that's just basically someone who trains staff um, with any new tech program that we have or help them build their curriculum. And so that's where I met Mary. But after working as an ITS in Chelmsford, I realized how much I missed work, like teaching myself, um, like teaching students. As much as I love adults, I love children more. <laughs> um, but Mary did come to Chelmsford and, you know, she talked a lot about UX design and how there's more to STEM than just coding. And that is what I am trying to do with my eighth graders by exposing them to different careers in computer science slash STEM. And I think it was very eye-opening for them when they realized that there, it's not just coding, there's design, there's other things that can make this field fun. So that is my current job and thank you. Hello everyone, um, my name is Malika Armand. I work at the Burke High School. Uh, well, we just had a name change. So we are the, now the Albert D. Holland High School of Technology um, in Dorchester, part of Boston Public Schools. Um, I started teaching eight years ago. Um, prior to that, I was in the IT field. I really had a desire to impact kids and let them know what's in the tech industry. At the time, um, my team was mostly folks, um, a lot of high talented folks on H-1B visas. And I, as a BPS alumni, I had always wondered, where are the Boston kids? How come no Boston kids are coming into IT? So I wanted to become a teacher and just see what's going on. and. How can I play a role in that? So I've been teaching for eight years. Um, I teach computer science. I also teach what's called a, um, a pathway, um, career and technical education pathway, preparing students to enter um, fields in media using the Adobe tools and also um, video making tools. So I really enjoy what I do. We, we have a lot of fun and I'm happy to be here. Awesome, thank you. Hi, um, hi folks, hope I didn't yell in the mic there. Uh, my name is Kevin, Kevin Hachua, and um, I was born and raised in Africa, came here about 13 years ago. So tech is something that's very new to me, uh, although I've been doing this for about 12 years now. Um, generally, like, you know, I come from a space where technology is not easily accessible, and even just knowing these opportunities are you know, out, out there and available for somebody like me to, to do and dive into. And those are the things that makes me very excited about you know, who, what Red Hat or what the tech industry has to offer to the younger communities or the younger generations and really getting them involved in game, giving them access to what is possible. Um, I've been working with Red Hat, I've uh, bounced around a, a while, but just sticking to the past three years, I've been working with Red Hat for, you know, for the last three years as a user, user experience designer. And the reason for that, again, is focusing on the end user, focusing on the people, making sure that whatever Red Hat builds is for the people, it's gonna address a very specific need in the same way that you know, I love the work that Mary does, um, and Julia and everybody else in this panel around supporting the community, because at the end of the day, right, like, that's really what it's all about. And uh, yeah, really glad to be here and really uh, looking forward to diving into the topics. Hey everyone, my name is Russell Lamberti. I am Director of Student Advancement and Partnerships at the Orchard Gardens K-8 Pilot School, which is part of Boston Public Schools. It is in Roxbury. Um, basically my um, title is kind of like Dean, um, but I deal with partnerships, which is probably about 
50% of my job, and I met Mary through um, a organization called STEM Match, and they match us up with Red Hat, um, and uh, the field trip was great, and we needed some help, and I reached out to Red Hat, not knowing anyone there, and probably being um, one of the least tech savvy people um, uh, here, and we needed help with our website, which we had one, but it wasn't really functioning, and it's been going on for like a year, and I'm excited to hopefully eventually get approval through the district, and uh, Mary and Matt can help us build something really, really cool. Um, I'm also one of those people that, um, unfortunately, I've loved every job that I've had, and I'm going on um, like 20 plus years working in either schools or um, non-profits, um, most of which in the city, and I realize that um, no matter how strong your school is or your organization working with youth, it, youth is, you always need um, support, and having access to tech is just something that's going to grow and grow, and, um, and I look forward to um, b um, finding more partners to uh, help our kids. Awesome. Well, thank you, guys. Oh, God, sorry, I keep forgetting that it's like right there. Um, so I think what I'm going to do next, I have, um, I want to make sure that everyone has time to like really kind of get into the meat of a topic that matters to them. Um, so I kind of have this set up where everyone will have like one question that is really pretty catered to what their specific area of this whole shindig is all about. Um, and then hopefully I have some time for anyone else who might have questions for this fantastic, lovely bunch of humans. Um, so my first question is for Julia. So if you want to get that, okay, cool, cool, never mind. Um, so Julia, as a full-time contributor to the tech industry, as you've mentioned, kernel engineer, um, what do you feel is the value that K-12 education collaborations bring into our industry? Yeah, so a couple of things. I mean, there's tons of benefits to it. Um, but so the certain type of engineering that I do is very hard. And having employees or people who work on it that have the basics down earlier is huge. Because then you don't have to worry about, oh, do I have a syntax error? Because you know, you've been coding for 20 years, not five years. Um, so definitely starting uh, to learn the basics early and hammering down those foundations um, is super beneficial um, you know, to the tech industry. Uh, starting young, another benefit would be children have confidence. They're confident about everything. There are things that I would have done 10 years ago that I won't even think about doing now. So if they're, you know, doing, you know, committing to an upstream community, like that's scary, but if they, you know, don't care about that, then they're gonna build that confidence early on. Um, and then when they're older working at a job, they're not even gonna think twice about it because um, they're already gonna have that confidence right there. Um, another really beneficial thing, especially in 2024, um, is the generation gaps. So kids nowadays, so we just finished uh, helping out with the high school intern program at Red Hat, and I quickly realized I don't know anything that the kids know nowadays. They use completely different tooling, applications. They just know, you know different things, so them passing that along to us is super helpful um, to keep us informed on the new trends um, and you know, having a different perspective from them on our work is actually super helpful as well. Um, but it's like when we hear about tools that you know we don't, we've never heard of before, that it could actually help our work a ton just by talking to a high school student and learning about the new, the new cool trends and tools. Um, yeah, so let me see what else. Um, yeah, that's basically, those are the most important things um, that, you know, 
kids could bring to the industry. But, you know, again, just different perspective um, and different skills. And that's how good tech and new innovations are created and are successful. Thanks, Julia. So the next question is going to be for Kevin. And it definitely is like kind of following up from uh, that. Um, you know, I, I would go out on a limb to say that uh, a huge aspect of why these partnerships matter as well is kind of creating that pipeline um, for diverse populations um, as well. So Kevin's going to speak a little bit to um, the impact on uh, diversification. So uh, the question I've got for Kevin is how can the tech industry support diversifying the industry and make the whole tech space more accessible for underrepresented populations. Test, test. All right. I'll just turn it off for a second. Um, that is a great question, Mary, and it is one that is packed. It's, it's a very packed question. So I'm going to try to answer the bits that I can, and invite others to, you know, ask follow up or maybe chime in as well. And I did have a couple of notes here, so don't mind me going through all of this, but. Generally, I think the technology industry has, uh, we, have, we are in a unique place today. We're in a space where I can't think of a single day-to-day -day interaction that does not involve technology. Therefore, we are in a place where we have the opportunity to rewrite the rules. Um, that means you know, as we define what experiences look like with technology or um, we really have the opportunity to determine what that looks like. And when we're talking about diversity or reaching out to younger groups, I think the emphasis there is inclusion is less should be less of an afterthought and more so a foundation of what we do and how we do things. And I'm very glad that Red Hat does this. You know, we can look at this panel and we can see, you know, just the diversity around that and how we try to bring people together in the various outreach program that Julia and Mary have reached uh, have touched on. Now we really try to you know to attack that. And I think you know the essence of it is it begins with education. I think you can speak to it better than I can, but um, from an early age, we have to try to get folks, we have to get people to understand who, uh, the possibilities are available. As I mentioned, I came from Cameroon. Um, computers is not something that I grew up with. The first time I came in touch with a computer was, I believe, literally when I landed in this country. I mean, I've, was, I've heard of them, but I never actually seen one or touched one. And that, made me, that makes me think of a, a particular study that was run by um, a doctor in India, Dr. Sugata Mitra. And what he did, this was back in 1999, he, it, it, the study was called A Hole in a Wall. What he did was go to one of the, uh, um, for lack of a better word, this one of the slums in, uh, within New Delhi and installed a computer you know, in a wall with no instructions whatsoever. And these are kids, you know, the village were from a place where folks have never had interaction with computers and technology, et cetera. And uh, yeah, he just left it there to see what would happen. He came back a week later. One thing that you know, they learned was not only did kids were able to turn on the computer, they were also able to surf the web. Beyond that, not only did they learn how to surf the web, they also learned how to code and build stuff. Beyond that, they, you know, they also learned how to, well, I just taught myself all these things. How can I propagate that? How can I teach others? And they just sort of saw this natural innovation and the spirit of just learning and developing within this community, although they never had access to computers. So that is one thing that I think is really crucial when we're talking about what can company do when it comes to K-12 and learning. Is I think when we provide kids with the opportunity and the possibility, you know, it's pretty much endless from there. And um, so again, going back to what Julie and Mary have said, is I'm very glad you know, that Red Hat has programs whether it's bringing in high school interns, college interns, working with you know, Boston middle schools or rally middle schools or even in Europe, we really try to nurture and engage this at a very, very early age because I think um, you know, if I, was, I think one of my last notes here is it's you know, diversity is not necessarily about just meeting check boxes, right? I said this earlier. It's, it has to be at the foundation of things we do. And when we invite all these various voices, it's, you know, it becomes less about um, more of a, a charity act. You no, know, diversity is not a charity thing that we need to do. Rather, when we have a variety of voices and opinion, that is how we build you know, really successful products. And it's not necessarily about 
the people who are in the room today or who are the loudest voices, but you know, giving attention to those who may not be heard because they were not given that opportunity. Um, it may give, you know, it gives opportunity to those who may not be seen, right? Once we understand that it takes a village, you know, to raise a kid, it takes a, a, a very diverse group of folks to build products, build products that really answer true human problems on an unbiased way. I think that's why we really care to bring in, you know, various uh, opportunities, various, uh, di um, various backgrounds, various, you know, age groups. So I think this is why it's essential to try to bring in kids or get them to understand this very early on. Um, I'm thinking myself for an example, when I was going to school, my counselor, when I graduated high school, my counselor told me to go to, uh, to community college and figure out what I wanted to do. Never did I knew that, did I know that I could work for a company like Google, Apple, Amazon, for the state of Massachusetts, for Red Hat, et cetera, right? Because I've never seen anybody that looks like me that works in these places. I've never heard of anybody like that looks like me that works in these places. But I think when we can show kids, when we can tell them like, hey, you can do this, you can, you can contribute. It has nothing to do with your race, your background, your ethnicity, et cetera. You know, um, innovation is found in all, throughout all these corners. And truly, a like, great innovation is when you bring all those things together, right, from all the varied um, opinions, perspective, to build something that is truly great. And it's not just from one particular section or one particular group. So that's why I think you know, it's very important for us tech companies to step in and take that challenge on. It's not an easy one, uh, but I'm very glad that Red Hat uh, uh, tried ma this made a bunch of different efforts and programs to tackle and take that challenge on. But yeah, I do think this is something that's really crucial and we should you know, keep our foot on the gas and keep pressing on. Thanks, Kev. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Kev. Um, so I think now that we've heard from a couple of folks on the tech side of things, we'll come back to uh, some more of our tech representatives here, but let's chat a little bit with some of our teachers. Um, so my next question is for my friend Pauline. Um, so as someone who is now in middle school as a CS teacher and has also worked in elementary school CS classrooms, um, you've really advocated, and you mentioned this in your introduction, for uh, the you know, power that comes when we bring students into environments or bring these different workplace environments to the student. Um, what, do you, what are some like, examples of like, or like impacts that you've really seen like with your students in your classroom with these types of partnerships? So I feel like um, kids get really excited when they actually get to see the real world connections. So when Mary came in to work with my fourth graders, um, because I've been teaching for eight years, so when she came into my fourth grade class to show them what she does, I think it was very eye-opening for them because she had them redesign a menu based on what the client wanted, and they just could not believe that designing, making the font pretty, and all that stuff was part of STEM. And I thought that was pretty cool. Another thing was I had a father come in who works at Raytheon, and he, he's really in it. And so he was describing um, all the things that he does, like the oil tanks, and I am probably saying this wrong, but he was in like a Black Hawk helicopter, and he had to build it and um, make sure it was bulletproof, and he was actually in it. And so he was very excited to talk about that, but the kids were like, oh my gosh, you were in it and being shot at and making sure it was safe. <laughs> and so I felt like it was really nice for them to see like the design process. Someone has to design it, someone has to test it, someone has to code it. Um, and there's different aspects of STEM and computer science, and it's not just coding. So my goal as an educator is to make sure that kids get excited and also how inclusive it is, just like everyone here has mentioned. I feel like technology is very inclusive, but kids are not um, getting that education or support they need to understand that it's not just coding. And I love bringing partnerships into it. I love having people come in. Um, it is part of the curriculum, or I feel like it should be part of the curriculum. I feel like it 
it should be, they should be able to see people who work in STEM and computer science so that they understand why they're taking or these classes, why these classes are required. I don't want them to come to my room and just say, oh, it's another specialist. I want them to come in, get excited, and walk away with something. And connecting it with the real world has been amazing, and they are actually loving it. So I'm happy on that part. So I'm thankful for the parent, and I'm also thankful for Mary um, for showing the kids the fun aspect of it. Um, but yeah, that's advocating for partnerships, I think it's huge, and I think all schools should have it. Thanks, Pauline. Um, so I'm going to basically turn the same question to Malika as well, um, looking at it from the perspective of your high school students. What sort of impacts do you see in your classroom, and how do your students react to these, ty these types of uh, opportunities? Um, before I answer that, I'd like to talk about how I met Mary. Um, one of the programs we have at our school is the PIT Council, Private Industry Council. So they place students in fields related to their career interests, whether it's medical, technology, and so forth. So I've always been on the lookout for internships in tech for my students, and a gentleman called um, Bruce Stevens talked to me about Mary and said she would be great um, to come into your classroom and lead some sessions, and that's how we connected. And Mary came in over a six week period. Um, she taught, um, I believe it was Illustrator, something similar to the menu. We worked on user experience design, which culminated in a field trip to Red Hat. And that was an eye opener for me to see, I could see the wheels spinning, like as they met different staff members at Red Hat, really starting to think about, oh, I could do this as a career. And I had a couple of students say, who are seniors Miss, I think I'm gonna change my major. So that was so impactful. Um, but getting back to the question, um, being away from IT, I find myself getting rusty. I'm not on the cutting edge. I, I don't know what's the latest and greatest, I'm not doing it. So to be able to connect students with, here's what's hot now, here's what's current now, like learn about the cloud, uh, be a developer on the cloud. Like I don't do it, but that's a marketable job if you can open your eyes to that. You may not even need a degree. You may be able to you know, make good money coding. So having that connection with industry is really important just to wake students up to these opportunities. Um, the curriculum that we have um, from the state doesn't really allow us to keep kids up to date. With the technology is outpacing us with what we're doing in the classroom. So we need the industry connection. We need the field trips. We need the internships. We need the summer jobs. And being in high school, like the more exposure that they can get at that age, at decision-making age of I need to figure out my career or I need some exposure to know is this something I want to do. Even a jo job shadowing opportunity, that's one of my, mis my missions this year, have students go and job shadow. What is it like to be a cl cloud architecture person? What do they do all day? <laughs> So those are the things I'm passionate about, so I want to make those connections for my students um, just to keep their eyes open for their future. Yeah, I really like, um, you said a specific phrase that I hadn't heard before. I think you said outpacing, like that, that our industry as the tech one is outpacing the curriculum, and I think that that's just a really good way to put it that I hadn't thought about before, that like, you know, we all see it, like, I know at least my job last year, like I was like, oh yeah, AI is like a thing. It probably won't really, like I won't have to do anything with it. And now it's like, it is my job. It, like I was tasked with, how can we sprinkle, the word sprinkle, AI into things more? And I was like, oh, okay, all right. But like, so I did not know that I would be there. So like I think a lot of us, our jobs look really different than what we expected. Like we didn't know necessarily where we might be even a couple months ago, so like the pace of things is crazy and it's impossible unless, even like as people that are sitting in it all day, every day, like we can't even keep up with it, so how can we expect people who aren't sitting in it all day to like be exposing their students to these new cool things when it's changing every five to six minutes? Um, so thank you for that, that was a really cool way to put it. Um, so I think if we could pass it down to Russ, um, our token administrator of the table. Uh, well, I guess we don't have a table. This line here. Um, as an admin, uh, 
What technological gaps do you see at that sort of more, whether it's like your school level or your system level, um, uh, your district even, uh, or even, even the larger like tech, or sorry, ed space, like what are some of the gaps that you see technologically there? So I'll, I'll start at a district level and uh, I won't bash Boston Public Schools too much because I do think we're a very progressive district and I think we have um, a lot of the tools uh, that our kids need. I think we're figuring out how to use all those. Um, and you brought up a great word and I think in my, in my bio, I actually said something similar is that we, we need to catch up with tech, and we can't wait another month, a week, or, or a day. And um, I'll give you an example quick that I just, I just thought about. We had a, a, a new teacher start last uh, year, and, uh, and I was on leave last year for a little bit with my uh, daughter, and I'm still trying to learn teachers' names. And one of the um, students was talking about AI, and I'm like, you know, I don't know much about AI, and but the teacher was using it to teach her class. And I'm like, I have no idea if we are even allowed to do this. W what's the district policy on using this? Um, and it like kind of hit me there where I'm like, she was a, uh, um, a younger uh, staff. This was her, I think, second year teaching and she was using the tools that she had and the tools that she uh, knew how to use and I had no clue how to even like talk to her about it. Uh, but I could tell that the students were benefiting from it. So I let it go and said, yeah, it's, it's fine. Until I know like what our policy is or what we're gonna use it for, it looks good to me now, so keep it up. Um, so that, that like gap is, um, you know, there's teachers that have been doing great work for years and years and years, right? But unless you're keeping up with the times and learning what, um, you know, your, your, there's kids in our school that know way more about tech than I do and certainly more than most of our, um, staff, right? So how do we use the knowledge that they already have? while we're still using the curriculum that the district wants us to use, but we're using it in a more, uh, excuse me, teaching it in a more creative tech uh, forward based um, way, right? Um, you know, all, all of our testing now is done on a Chromebook and it wasn't like that a few years ago. Um, and, and is that a benefit for kids? Do kids test better using, you know, a number two pencil on paper, or is it better for them to use the actual Chromebook, right? Do they read the words better? Do they know how to answer the, um, you know, the uh, questions better on paper or a, or a screen? Uh, and I'm sure there's a study done by this, but I also know like, how are we teaching this stuff during the uh, day, right? So um, Kevin brought up, access and I think that's always going to be the biggest thing, right? It's having access to all the tools that we that we need. Um, and then once we have that, how do we keep everything working how it's supposed to be working? So you can have 15 kids in your class and 12 of them, everything's fine. Wi-Fi is fast at the house. Chromebooks are working. Um, the software on their Chromebooks or in the cloud works great. And then there's two or three students that all have these issues at home. Wi-Fi is too slow. Pages won't, won't uh, load, right? And it's not that they don't know how to do their work, but if it takes them triple the amount of time because their Wi-Fi is so slow at home, that's a lot of time for a kid to be staring at a screen, right? Um, and they might just not finish because, hey, they have to go to bed at nine o'clock or 10, right? Um, these are very like simple, simple things, but I think all of the problems that we do have or our gaps, and I, I'm probably gonna say 100% of them will be solved through something 
related in tech. It's just going to keep moving faster and faster, and I think we are being outpaced. Uh, I think we're doing our uh, best, but I think those gaps are all going to be solved through uh, tech and through partnerships. Like, I would love for Mary to go to every single one of my rooms and be like, let me look at everyone's Chromebook, website, look at all your programs, and just go through and just make sure that everything's working great, right? Um, that would actually solve a lot of our um, kind of like day-to-day problems, so I hope that answers your question. Only if anything, you nailed everything there. I think if anything, that's an invitation to all of y'all as builders, you know, and designers, developers, as you're building these tools, how can you increasingly make those things more accessible? Like, so when we talk about large language model, those things require you know, pretty significant amount of computing power. So for somebody, as you mentioned, Russ, I, my parents cannot afford to buy me a laptop that can do these things. How can we build these tools that maybe it's a bit more u ubiquitous? It's not, it doesn't require you to have a crazy amount of power. It doesn't require you to plug this thing into a high-speed internet. So just general, something for us to think about. It's not a solution that we can address, to, not the problem we can address tomorrow, but something uh, as we build stuff, how can we just be mindful of, you know, of that? Thank you. Can I add something to it? Yeah, yeah you can. can. So just, so, <laughs> So, so my, my uh, school has a focus on the arts, right? Um, so um, we don't use, you know, we use tech in these classrooms, but we don't use them much. And the reason is because the way the curriculum is being given to the teachers and the standards, it doesn't call for any of it. And I'm not saying that we need to use it in every single class. There's obviously classes that um, tech will be used um, less. Um, but we have to keep moving forward and teaching. So again, painting is great using actual you know, um, paper and um, scissors and, and all that stuff is great, right? But most design now is not done like that. It's done on a laptop and our students once they see these things being done are like drawn to it They're like oh my god like I can make or design my own logo or sneaker using this program and they want to do it and they can do it faster and they can do it um, you know uh, cleaner and uh, neater and that like sparks something in them and Again, I'm not bashing Boston Public Schools, but I, but I think we just need to make sure that we're focused on having great um, you know, scores is also, it's really important, but we have to figure out maybe we need new categories and have some tech-focused ca categories um, that we can kind of use, use those to judge where our students are going, and we can't start in eighth grade, we have to start in first grade. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we'll pass the microphone to Matt. I do want to do a quick like, little like segue, because I just kind of had a little brain blast just now. Um, so I kind of have been hearing, as we've been going down the line, sort of like two camps of like what these partnerships could look like. Julia talked a little bit about the camp of like hands-on like working with the students and then a lot of our teachers kind of like echoed that and then um, we heard a little bit about like sort of more almost the tech support side of things like someone who maybe isn't teaching your kids about the tech but coming in and giving their laptops the support they need um, so I think Matt will probably talk a little bit more about some of this but as a largely technical crowd at this conference I think this is a little bit of where my I'm gonna not even be subliminal with it, I'll just say this is my call to action. So like, perk up. It's, uh, here's my CTA. It's um, that as technologists, there are ways that we can kind of plug in even the most like technical hands to keyboard skills to our communities, even if we're not directly interfacing with students. So uh, 
I will kind of direct this last official question to Matt here. Um, what are some ways that um, experienced technical professionals can help fill some of the gaps, like the ones Russ mentioned or others you might have uh, noticed yourself um, in the education space beyond like direct involvement with the students themselves? Uh, so uh, my first entry into like anything tech um, was probably around like middle schoolish age. That was like uh, when uh, my parents had like a computer that they gave to me and they said, hey, this is your computer, you take care of it, you, you know, you manage it, all that sort of stuff, but you can, you know, use it as you want, all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, if I wanted to go play a game or anything, or if I wanted to, you know, upgrade the hardware on it, that was like, uh, oh, this is something I need to go out and learn and do all that sort of stuff. Uh, and I, um, you know, I feel like uh, in the tech industry in general, uh, a lot of people kind of have this kind of like a bit of a scrappy startup of like, you know, your origin story of getting into tech was not that like you were like, you know, officially trained and like you know the official way and got licensed and all that kind of stuff. Like a lot of times it's, you know, people are kind of like learning the bits and pieces of what they need to do in order to be able to fix something or do something better. And like it almost kind of like grows organically. Uh, I think that kind of experience is something that's very universal. Uh, you know, a lot of like, kids and stuff trying to learn, they will imprint on what they see. And so as uh, people in the tech industry, the more that we can kind of, uh, you know, create opportunities for them to, you know, uh, get like a sandbox environment that they can, you know, uh, play around with. Like, if you want to teach a kid how computers work, Tell them in the morning that if you can get every computer in this room to have Fortnite installed, by the afternoon, they will have learned about networks, they would have learned about installing software, they would have learned about so many different things, which is really not that far off from you know working in an enterprise. Uh, because at the end of the day, people are just gonna go and invest their uh, time and effort and learn about the things that interest them. So, uh, you know, as much as you know, it can be super dry doing some of the uh, s like really in-depth technical stuff. There's a lot of different ways that you can kind of make that stuff approachable, so that like uh, in the classroom, kids can learn, even on their own time, kids can learn. And you know, uh, there's a lot of technology out there nowadays that makes it uh, accessible, like you know, the Chromebooks and having stuff out in the cloud that didn't exist, you know, 20 years ago, and uh, really creates, uh, you know, little, almost like maker spaces that uh, kids could go out and, you know, play around with a little bit. You know, hopefully if you can, you know, put some guardrails up so that they're not like getting like, you know, thousand dollar cloud bill. But uh, yeah, I, I think things like that, uh, even outside of directly interacting, just creating, you know, the encouragement and like the opportunity. And uh, also uh, talking about uh, some of the stuff that I have also done with Mary and Russ, uh, you know, there is also uh, real opportunity uh, and like need in the uh, education system just for, you know, some of the more basic IT stuff. Uh, in our case, we were trying to redesign the school website and we were trying to, you know, get some stuff out there for, uh, to be able to make it easier for the kids who might not know English to be able to go in and find what they're gonna have for lunch this week. Like small things like that that, you know, until you actually sit down and have somebody think about this and design a web page and put it out there, it's not going to exist. Uh, and even in the middle of doing all that sort of stuff, uh, a night before Christmas, we were hanging out uh, with my family and we were gonna show them this little side project we've been working on and you know, go to discover that uh, a IP from Brazil had been slamming the school website <laughs> with uh, attempts to log in with the admin account and uh, the school website did not look like the school website anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes finding out stuff like that and even being able to kind of break that down into a digestible, like, hey, 
we got a problem. Let's go get the appropriate authorities involved. <laughs> Uh, sometimes, like it couldn't even be elements like that. You you really never know. Sometimes, just making that connection and going out and finding what these people need, uh, you can discover that there is a lot of opportunity there to kind of like you know the funding would not be there traditionally. So that like stepping out and doing that stuff pro bono, you can really solve some real big problems that would not get solved otherwise. Yeah, definitely. To that point, and Russ, some of yours as well, uh, that particular incident was kind of a particularly spicy one. Like, it, it was it was drama. But uh, there was just a lot of little incidences where, you know, if, if the centralized IT department of, like, school systems had, like, more personnel and more funding and, like, really just people to kind of help maintain some of, like, the infrastructure and systems that schools rely on, like, Maybe stuff like this wouldn't happen, uh, and you know, but, but we're at an open source conference, right? Like we're all people who kind of we are a little scrappy. We tinker with things just kind of because we think it's fun, and so I don't know if there. I hope that we're not the only people out there that maybe are thinking, I've got whether it's in my case UX skills and uh, infrastructure skills, development skills. Is there not maybe a community? to be made out there of people who are like, hey, I got these skills and I want to use them somehow. Why not like pro bono ourselves out to like our nonprofits and our education uh, systems out there to kind of fill some of those gaps that frankly just aren't being filled right now for reasons that aren't <laughs> the, the nonprofits and aren't the school's faults. Um, so I don't know if that exists yet, but this is kind of my informal introduction to like, let's make it. Let's let's do that. Um, so I do. That's my last official question. But I see a, an excited yeah. Kevin. I mean, I can I can agree with you. I can probably hear me better. Yeah, I mean, um, you, if you haven't stopped on UX Mini Hub channel already, this is why we talk to everybody. At the end of the day, all of us we're trying to make all of us as technologists or as a, I like this. I like the word builders. Like that doesn't necessarily have a particular role attached to it. As we're making things. We want to make sure that those things are useful to solve a problem, whether for kids, whether for adults, like what issue are we solving, usable, usable for whoever you problem you trying to solve, and then use it. You know, and then you talk to a doctor. So as you're building things, make sure you're addressing particular issues, and make sure that you know it is useful for those people who are going to use it, whoever that target customer is. And the usable part is actually I can use it, right? Whether it's on my phone, whether it's on my laptop, whether whatever that may be. So there's many ways that all of us, I think, can contribute to that, whether it's, as Mary has said, we're developers, engineers, designers, there's a bunch of different chunks to help solve this big problem of education in STEM. So there's, I imagine, tiny bits and pieces of this jigsaw puzzle that each of us can plug into. So I can contribute to this piece, and overall, right, we address it or help tackle the bigger conversation. So yeah, so it's, it's kind of like bringing it back full circle, I suppose. <laughs> totally. So that was it for like the pre-question, like the, not pre-questions, that obviously is like the end of it, but uh, the questions that I had, but I am really curious, um, you know, I know it's end of the day of the last day, so like I totally get if everyone's like hard pass, but yeah, go for it. Do you want me to pass the mic around or anything? Yeah, uh, so um, my, my question was about um, accessibility of, of, of software and stuff to, to everybody, right? So, like, it got me thinking, I mean, well, the, the Chromebook with the slow Wi-Fi at home is bad enough, but then, like, you know, the school system gets a grant from Adobe, and they, the kids can use Illustrator and all these tools at school, but they go home and they can't afford, I mean, who can afford, I mean, the Adobe tools are expensive. So, is there an effort... Um, I don't know that I hear about this, so maybe it exists and I'm totally unaware. Uh, is there an effort to make use of open source software, community projects, you know? So instead of Illustrator to use like, you know, uh, Inkscape or the GNU image, yeah, the GIMP tools, stuff like that, which are free and, and yeah. yeah, okay, great. So as part of the pathway that I teach, we are grant funded by the state. So I do get Adobe licenses, is it on? Yeah, so I do receive uh, Adobe licenses for my students. However, so if a student outside of my program wants to use Adobe, um, wants to create designs and 
videos and so forth, I need to find that open source code. Or say my computer science students want to do some video work. So I recently learned about DaVinci. I think that's open source free. Right? Once I hear free, I'm like, OK, I got to go figure this out. So our district, um, I feel like we could do more to fund technology, but a lot of it is left up to the teacher. Like when I first started teaching, I was teaching coding on Chromebooks. I'm like, this is crazy. Like who does this? So when I got the opportunity to teach the DVC program and heard that every year, you know, the grant will fund your program, 20, 30, 50 grant, whatever I need, for the most part gets approved. But that's not the case for every teacher at Boston Public School. So the more open source code that we can access benefits every student. Yeah, that was kind of so I was kind of wondering. Yeah, so do do, do programs um, are, are you are you are programs generally okay with the, with the grant situation? I guess grants can't be always taken for granted. So does that leave you, you know, uh, uh, tenuous about what might be available next year to your students, right? And you have to revamp might have to revamp entire curriculums or if the, you know, the software changes. I mean. In my case, it's paid for every year. Oh. That's unusual though. That's, That's the That's CTE, Career and Technical Education Program, funded by the you know, grants with the state of Massachusetts. Okay. That's not the case of every, you know, every teacher. So I'm I feel blessed because we need money. We can't teach tech without money. So definitely gotta be well funded. Yeah, I was gonna kind of pull in, put uh, Ross on the spotlight here for a second, but I was gonna say that's the es that's the essence of open source, right? As you touched on, is we have all these tools, and maybe it's a matter of how do you bake this into existing curriculum or maybe upcoming curriculums. Teachers, you know, there there's some limitation to that, to like what you can bring into school, what you can expose your kids to, and maybe like just as far as like a district you know, or various districts or states even. What uh, what's currently available? How can we take that? Both of you touched on it. Like, is technology is outpacing us? So maybe it's a matter of taking a look, a retrospective, and saying, well, these things are currently available. How can we then leverage that to enable kids who don't need to pay for services, or maybe even takes less of the load, you know, of the state themselves having to dish out money to pay for Adobe licenses because you can leverage things that are open source. So maybe it's just a matter of like revising how we build our curriculums. But out of my Space entirely. No, I don't even know what I'm talking about. So I said I'm gonna pull in Russ to see you know, if there's anything that he might want to chime in here. Uh, sure. I mean, you, you know, um, so you're 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 in a spot where you have money every single year, so you kind of know like what your curriculum is gonna be, right? Um, and and I brought up something about a teacher using um, AI to uh, teach, right? Um, she just decided to do it. I don't know if it was a uh, program that she paid for. I don't, you know, but it, but it was working. I could probably guess uh, that the district is not. I'm sure there's been some discussion about using open source, but I also know every uh, <laughs> the amount of money that we spend. There's a list of vendors that we use and they have to be approved and they, you know, if it's above a certain amount of um, dollars, uh, there's a bidding process and the time that it takes to do that is, you know, say we wanted to do that to start this school year, I, I would probably have to start planning that curriculum a year ago, right? And the teachers that I would want to teach it might no longer be at my school uh, because the process is so long. Um, so I think, you know, uh, well one is like educating um, the district about what the benefits of open source is, right? And almost finding what the district thinks about it and if they have, you know, um, a negative aspect of it or just thoughts of it, how do we change that and how do we tell them the benefits of it and say, hey, by the way, it's not gonna cost this much money and it's open and kids can use it at home and it's gonna save time for um, school's uh, staff and you know, just showing them what, um, 
what the abilities are, I think would be great. You know, um, th there's so many things that I want to do on my computer at school, and I'll go on and I'll be like, wait, I can't even read this document because I don't have this license is not up to date. But my principal's license is, or maybe the, you know, teacher's licenses, and it's such a strange thing because the amount of time that it takes me to go out of my day just to review a document that might take a few minutes to read, but the license expired on mine, and then we have to figure out how to pay for my license, and it's all these things, and there has to be a better way, but we, but we have to think about, you know, uh, like the whole process and how we're using tech and I don't know if there's a group of people in the district that are uh, you know, trying to like reimagine this. It would be great if you know maybe Mary and Matt can start that, and I will help you guys, obviously. But uh, you know, but but that's kind of what we need, right? Is someone to come in and say, guys, this is what we got. How great is this? We can solve these problems for you. Uh, I just want to add a little bit onto that. Um, so when I came to education, uh, I was so frustrated my first year because everything you need and ask for, there's either no money or you gotta, even with my grants, I have to ask a year ahead of time. So this fall, um, I will receive things that I asked, submitted to the budget last year. So we're always a year behind. So I think it's a it's just an industry shift. So education, the industry of education is different from IT. I was in IT. We had paying customers. There's revenue. There's bottom line. Keep the customer happy. Whatever the expense, we do it for the customer. In education, it, it was it's just been like another world, and I've kind of calmed down, you know, <laughs> over the years. But it's it's really a struggle to you know get the things that we need, and I think in the education sector, also it's under local um, kind of government, like city of Boston is controlling a lot of what we do at our in our school system. So that slows things down, even the approval process of when you submit a request, there may be 12 signatures that must be had before you, know, you get an item. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to say. But we are almost at time, so I do want to make so sure if there was any other we questions, <laughs> we also get a chance. I thought I saw another yeah. hand. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm a student in the public system, so I'm hearing now that there's more questions that are on public values. Um, Thank you. No worries. So yeah, um, working in public interest technology, we share a lot of the same values of open source and making sure that we're making technology accessible and including communities and co-design processes. Um, and one of the things that I've seen be successful is experiential learning programs at the higher education institutions in the area producing resources for um, organizations that might not necessarily have the full-time staff to do so. So I'm just like brainstorming back here in terms of what like a project might look like if there is a resource that can be created in an open source manner for this type of need. Um, and I, my question is, like what would the audience of the open source project that would be most useful for you right now be? Would it be something for students to access? Would it be an education resource to update teachers? Or would it be something like an open source website template for school administrations to use? So that's what I'm curious about. Can you take it? Um, n might be a naive answer, but I think, thanks for that question by the way. I think that's the essence of open source is you know, very much open. You know, regardless of what project, whatever thing you're trying to contribute, contribute to the community. There's probably somebody out there that might benefit from it. So when it comes to education, I think is the same windows and doors are open, which are whatever project that somebody might be working on, you know, put it out into the world, you know, let it breathe and see what comes of it. And that's, you know, that's really it. And let other people contribute to it. Maybe you're starting something, you're just lighting the candle, and other people are gonna throw more firewoods on top of that, right? And more gasoline, and et cetera, and, and it grows into something bigger. So as you said, it could be an educational website, it could be a little tiny thing, and then it grows into something bigger, or it could start big and then grows even bigger. So I don't think that there's any particular thing that the open source community is looking forward to latch onto today. I mean, AI is probably the biggest thing, so 
folks are con act actively contributing to the AI, you know, Git repos and libraries to make sure we let's build one AI or multiple AI uh, or large language models that are very inclusive based on X, Y, Z. But no, nonetheless, I think truly, at least this is my take, when I joined Red Hat is if I have an idea about something, build it and that will come. Like build it, put it out there and see how people react. See, you know, this might be useful to others, might not be useful to everybody, but one person might find it useful and contribute, they may not, I don't know, but ideally, I don't think, at least from, from, our, from my stand, there's no one particular thing that like, let's focus on this as a community, just this one thing, because yeah, it's a little bit broad. Maybe that's a non-answer. <laughs> Uh, just to add on to that, um, as a teacher, what would be great to see if you mentioned um, website, open source website templates, definitely we could use that. We're using an outside agency right now to build our school website at a cost, and our funds are really, really limited. Uh, resources for teachers would be great, and even students too. You know, what resources, I, I would take it all. I would check all the boxes and say thank you very much. I, I was going to say the same thing, honestly. I feel like a common thread of something that I've heard from educators and even like internally with our like, you know, emerging talent team who's trying, you know, hosting things like our high school internship program. We, I've been trying <laughs> as we do things at the office to um, create lesson plans to open source out to teachers so that if you are not near an office that hosts these type of events, you could you know, take the little bits and pieces that we use to carry them out and carry them out in your own classroom. I had been putting them on Teachers Pay Teachers. I know uh, some districts don't like their teachers to use it anymore because of some, you know, potential, ooh, I stole someone else's lesson plan type of stuff. So a more like open source place, like a curriculum open sourcing. So there's no sense of like, this was mine and you stole it, so you put it out into the open. So it's for everyone. So like open sourcing curriculum, I think is a platform that I have been wanting for like Red Hat to be like, hey, let's do that. I don't know if it will ever happen. We'll see, but I think it'd be really cool. Um, there are some things actually going on at Red Hat that do that. Uh, so I run a program called Kernel Development Learning Pipeline um, and it came from Red Hat, it's funded by Red Hat. And basically what it is, is my coworker and I, we teach kernel development at UMass Lowell. And then we ha like make the homework assignments and the curriculum kind of similar to things that they would be seeing if they were a full-time kernel engineer. Um, and then, you know, at the end of this course, the goal is that they're ready to basically start at a kernel engineering job and they'll be able to be successful. Um, this program has been successfully running for three years now um, and we have all of our materials open sourced on the Linux Foundation um, and just other websites that we've uh, you know, communicated with the public about and it's been great. We've had s students that took the class three years ago are helping us with uh, lecture material for this fall, actually. So it's a great, you know, it's built a little community, um, but that can be done for, like pipelines like that could be done for anything. Could be done for any topics, for any level of uh, students, um, and it's, you know, the embracing the open source, it's huge. Because then it, there's a lot of stuff we don't have to do because our old students are eager to come back and help and do the work for us, so. I think that's the start of it, and um, you know, it's 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 not my job or or our job, right? It's everyone that's like above us that has to be like, wait a second, we can do this. It was like, yes, but like we can do it for every single school, not just one school, right? Um, and I think it's like thinking really, really big, and then realizing that there's people out there that have the ability to solve problems for us. We just, one, don't know how to ask them and don't realize that it's, it's hopefully will 
cost less than what we're spending in uh, time and um, money. So, so you're welcome to, I can ask teachers and parents and staff and be like, email me all your problems that are tech related and you can solve one or 20. Like, that's what we want, you know, so. I, I just like to say too, uh, from like an institutional kind of standpoint, uh, that a lot of the uh, work that needs to get done is often kind of that proof of concept of like, if you're trying to set up your first website and you don't know what the cloud is, you don't know what a framework is, you don't know all of these kinds of technical concepts, just being able to take like a open source communities like hello world website and be able to say that, okay, this will give me something to start from because, uh, you know, there's a lot of appetite for um, them to like, you know, at the school level of what they want to do. And a lot of times they just don't have that spare resources to kind of go and test out some of that sort of stuff. So from the tech, you know, perspective, if you already have all that expertise, your pro bono contribution of being able to say, hey, this is how you build a website and this is where you can kind of get started. Like, you know, as Kevin like had said earlier, like you put it out there and then it will get build its own, you know, energy and all that sort of stuff and get going. And um, I'm open to you sharing <laughs> any links and resources either through Mary or I'm not sure how we can share that information. I would we'll figure out something. I would post it um, for my everyone in my school to have access to and they can tinker. I know we're like very over time, so I don't know if anyone else needs this room, so I will So if there's other questions or thoughts or dance parties to be had, go for it. Here I can bring this one. You got it? Yeah, yeah, you do it up. Do it. Thank you guys. So uh, my background's in K-12 IT, so I spent about 12 years in that world, so I very rural, very impoverished area, so this is very much my passion uh, before coming to Ubuntu. I feel like it just ties hand in hand with open source. I've heard a lot of these conversations in the past, uh, educators, administrators struggling with the same problems, um, and a lot of them have come up with their own unique and novel ideas on how to solve it, but they don't share it, and it's very frustrating for me because like one school is, is running into an issue maybe with like a, a curriculum built around open source, while another school over here said, oh, we solved that years ago. But they're just not sharing that. So it sounds like there's maybe like that lack of that networking and communication. We need that centralized place to, to take this collective brain trust and bring it all together. Um, so so there's lots of a question, <laughs> but, uh, but it's just, just a thought that I had. Um, so uh, do you think there is an opportunity that we could maybe combine this like collective effort of all the schools and all of your work uh, and, and, and use it, I guess, to improve access and opportunity for, for kids around the world. And the takeaway I got, I think, from, from Kevin was, uh, and it reminded me of a quote, that is, uh, talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. Um, so thank you, guys. I will definitely be picking your brain substantially. <laughs> yes. So this may be the start of something that is very well needed here in the district. Oh, yeah, of a board meeting? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, I don't even think I can answer that question as well. I mean, that's a great point. And I think the, I'm not in the educational system at all. I, I don't match up to these guys up here. Uh, but one thing that comes up to mind is maybe com comparing the state of Florida to the state of Massachusetts and how our educational systems and what's allowed to teach and what's not allowed, how those things can conflict. So this idea of creating something centralized, I think it's a vision but how do we get, you know, it, it might be like more, I think, institutional issue than what can we actually do? Because I, I feel that we can, there's a lot we can do, but there's a lot of alignment and sort of, you know, um, herding cats and getting people on the same line. And this is, you no, know, not just across state lines, even within district. Again, they probably could speak better to this than I can, but there's a lot of alignment, I think, you know, as far as like what is Worcester teaching versus what is Boston public schools teaching and how can we all teach the same thing or maybe come up with a centralized way to do that. 
So that's a very, I think that's a unique issue that we can, you know, it's good to keep in mind and how can we tackle that? But yeah, good thing to keep in mind. I appreciate you bringing that up. That's a wrap. Right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys.